Welcome back. We're talking about the ongoing talks between the United States, Canada, and Mexico over NAFTA. Let's get back to our panel right now. And Sarah, and I want to start with you again. Yeah. Uh, the president is threatening to withdraw from NAFTA if he doesn't get what he wants. But he's been warned by even people in his own Republican Party that this could hurt U.S. manufacturing. It could hurt uh, the jobs in the United States as well. It could hurt U.S. farmers. So. Uh, what does the president need? What does he need to get out of these negotiations so that he can go out there and claim victory? Well, uh, one of the things that he's trying to get is uh, to get an idea about this trade def deficit business. What measures can NAFTA countries come up and give them a less of a trade deficit? Right? They, they're trying that. I don't think that's going to work. But Anand, I'm just going to criticize a little bit as to the concept of renegotiation here. Now, let's talk about a marriage, right? They've been married for, what, six, 23 years. Let's look at Canada and Mexico as one part and the United States as the other spouse. They have some problems, right? They want to talk about it, and they go to a marriage counselor. And the United States is bringing its divorce attorney to the first session. <laughs> That's exactly what's happening here. I mean, let's, uh, let's, let's be serious. Who, who puts a five-year clause that says, well, if the numbers are not right, any one of us can say they are not right, and we will get out of this agreement. So just that point sends a message to Canadians and Mexicans that the president is not serious about this. And that's why they're worried that he might just walk out. But there are legal implications of that, too, right. because the Congress ratified this, this agreement. Right. Richard, what is your view on that? Is this an agreement that needs to be changed with or without the divorce attorney? Let me be as blunt as I know how. I don't think it matters. In other words, I don't think for the majority of people, neither in Mexico, nor Canada, nor the United States, it matters a whole lot whether it survives or it changes. Because in my judgment, and I may be in disagreement with some of your other guests, it is not a great success. Over the life of NAFTA, the inequality inside the United States and inside Mexico, I'm not sure of the numbers in Canada, has gotten much worse. The predictions of job creation in the United States haven't worked out. The prediction of job creation and prosperity in Mexico didn't work out. Millions of Mexicans over the life of this experience came to the United States and are now being thrown out of the country with a level of human suffering and pain and dislocation. This is not a successful story. What's being done here is fights between groups of businesses, one of whom wants the NAFTA to go this way, one of whom wants to preserve it over here. They will fight it out like they did in the 1990s. They'll come up with a new agreement that makes money for some and loses for others. And all the rest of us will be sitting around the table 20 years from now having the same conversation. Manuel, do you want to respond to that? Yes, uh, Professor Wolf's uh, analysis is deeply flawed. And it, it, it's understandable coming from a Marxist as he is. Um, first of all, if he knew anything about uh, the numbers, he would know that the part, the Mexican economy associated with NAFTA has grown at 6.5% per year. Employment has grown enormously. Wages have improved enormously. It is the part of Mexico which is not in any way connected with NAFTA that has lagged behind. What we have to do is bring that part of the Mexican economy which is lagging behind, which still employs 80% of the Mexican workers, uh, yes. but at very low wages. That yes. has to be modernized and brought into the fold of NAFTA and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, overall uh, quality of the agreement that has improved um, the, the northern part of the Mexican economy. That's, that's one aspect. Uh, another is uh, the distribution of uh, income and wealth. Uh, that, this has become a very fashionable thing. Uh, according to the best statistics that we have, both international and Mexican, the, the distribution of wealth has improved in the last 10 years in Mexico. Uh, Not at all. We, well, we can discuss the sources and we can discuss uh, the, the figures, but. Mm. Uh, no we, we have a dynamic, dynamic economy which is growing at 2.5%, not as fast as we should right. be growing. Okay. But that's because, as I said, we have a bifur bifurcated country yeah. in two segments. Okay, Richard, I'm going to give you a chance to respond very quickly, then I want to go to Christelle. Okay, NAFTA didn't promise to help 20% of the Mexican people when it was negotiated. It was supposed to help all of them. If 80% have been left out, what kind of a statement is that about the success? And 
let me be blunt. Mexico reported this last week that it had 29,000 murders last year, the worst since it ever started keeping records. These are not signs of a successful economic relationship in the North. It made profits for some. Walmart is very happy. But for the mass of people, including the mass of the Mexican people, this has not been a successful arrangement. And that's not a surprise because the people who negotiated okay. it and the people who make it happen are not interested in that. Okay, Christelle, let's listen to what the Canadian Foreign Minister Christia Freeland had to say about NAFTA. Canada doesn't view trade surpluses or deficits as a primary measure of whether a trading relationship works. Nonetheless, it's probably worth pointing out today that our trade with the U.S. is balanced and mutually beneficial. So, Christelle, firstly, is that a fair reading of the situation? And, and given that NAFTA is mutually beneficial, what does Canada hope to get out of these talks? Well, just to go back on the previous point, I think yeah. from a Canadian perspective, NAFTA has really been instrumental in bringing Canada to the 21st century and really making us strong. So we don't have to go back that far to, to just back in the early 80s, before uh, the first Canada-US free trade agreement was signed. Um, Canada was among the most protectionist countries of the OECD back then. And back then we had inflation mortgage rate and unemployment rate in the double digit and it was really through opening our doors to the United States through import competition that we managed to improve our productivity, really increase output in the manufacturing sector despite some job losses among lower skills worker, but we really managed to make some big headways in terms of our economic development thanks to our opening uh, to the competition from, uh, from the United States and through also allowing Canadian firms then to tap into the big market that the U.S. is. They, they, it allows them to specialize in what they do best, but also to reap the benefits of econo economics, econ econ economies of scale. So it was really key for uh, the, ca the Canadian economy over the past 30 years. And that's why um, Mrs., um, Minister Freeland is, um, is stressing these points. Theron, let's talk about China. China is now Mexico's third largest export partner, receiving $5 billion in, $5 billion in goods in 2016. It also imports 20% of its goods from China. Uh, let's listen to the Mexican president, Enrique Peña Nieto, on his outreach to the Asia-Pacific. The Asia-Pacific region is key for our strategy of diversification. This year will be for us about widening political, commercial relations and investment in our country amid the wide-ranging and progressive renegotiation of the Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the modernization of the free trade agreement with countries in the region. If there is no deal with NAFTA, does China stand to benefit? Um, absolutely. Even if there is a deal, because the relations are, the relationship is so sour right now, and none of these countries, Mexico is not sitting down, Canada is not sitting down and waiting for the end of NAFTA renegotiations. This has already started. Mexican delegates visited China last year. They talked about different types of um, cooperation. They acknowledged that they are manufacturing competitors, but also they are trying to find ways how they could complement one another. Now, this is not only in Mexico. By the way, Mexico is not only with China, they're also negotiating with Brazil and Argentina. They're trying to get the cost of grain imports lower, uh, have uh, other market access to those countries. Canada is doing that too. Canada is talking with China. Look, with all this uproar and everything, we just forgot that Canada signed an agreement with the European Union that came into effect in late September. But it has to be ratified by every single EU country, yes, but that's going to open a probably 500 million customers to Canadian business. So these countries are preparing for the worst. And we just announced that uh, TPP uh, is resuming without the US. Uh, there will be a signature of TPP without the US in the next three months. Uh, and there are other deals being done. Mexico is modernizing its uh, trade agreement with the European Union as well. And that should be ready within the next three months as well. Uh, and uh, bear in mind also that this is a total package deal. If we are hit in, in uh, the trade front, we can hit back in other fronts, including, including security. And by the way, it might, be, it might help uh, that Professor Wolf knows that if he stops uh, buying uh, drugs in the streets of New York, uh, the problem of violence in Mexico will diminish quite substantially. He and his fellow Americans. So 
uh, that issue uh, is one that uh, should be very much burdened in mind. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. We've run out of time. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.